Hello and welcome to our virtual celebration for Human Rights Day 2020. And what a year it has been. One that many of us in every corner of the globe are, I am sure, keen to leave behind us. With hopes for a much, much better, kinder 2021. At the UN Human Rights Office, we fervently share this hope and we would like to use this Human Rights Day to reflect on just how we can recover better together from all that 2020 has thrown at us. I'm Ravina Shamdasani, a spokesperson for the office, and I've had the honor of being part of the UN's inspiring human rights work for more than a decade now. And today I look forward to sharing with you in this program many of the important lessons that human rights defenders from across the globe have put to us. Lessons that will surely help us to breathe life into the Human Rights Day theme this year. Recover better, stand up for human rights. Now, what does better look like? What kind of action can take us there? How do we learn from the mistakes of the past so that we are not doomed to repeat them? Today, you will be able to see and hear stories of inspiration and action, and perhaps there will be a lesson from one particular story that can then be transposed to your own community. You will hear from experts like the World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, on what better looks like in terms of the right to health. Artist, activist, and UN Ambassador Forrest Whitaker will tell us how promoting sustainable development can help us all to recover better and to leave no one behind. Award-winning musical composer Max Richter and award-winning filmmaker Yulia Mer will bring you a stirring performance based on the ideals of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was born on this day 72 years ago. And we will bring you an interview with one extraordinary woman who has lived, served, and led through many crises, our High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. She will be answering questions, including some sent by you, at the end of this show. So please stay tuned, and happy Human Rights Day. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, has been calling for unity and solidarity to fight the virus. The pandemic has laid bare just how weak public health systems are in many nations, low-income, middle-income, and high-income countries. To recover better, Dr. Tedros says this must change. The right to health is a fundamental human rights, and governments worldwide have an obligation to guarantee access to adequate health care for those within their territories. Here's Dr. Tedros's message to us this Human Rights Day on Recovering Better. In 1948, as the world sought to rebuild from the horrors of the Second World War, two documents came into force that have shaped the health of the world's people for more than 70 years. One was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the other was the Constitution of the World Health Organization. Both affirm that health is a fundamental human right, not a privilege for those who can afford it. This year's theme for International Human Rights Day is Recover Better, Stand Up for Human Rights. It's a reminder that human rights, including the right to health, must be at the heart of our response to COVID-19. The global recovery and our efforts to accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals. We need to think not only about the most effective ways to recover from the devastating impacts of this pandemic, but to do so with strategies designed to build more equal, inclusive and equitable societies. COVID-19 is a global crisis, and the tools to defeat it must be shared equitably with all nations as global public goods, not private commodities that become another reason some people are left behind. WHO stands with the UN Secretary General's call to action on human rights. This is a time for strength multilateralism and global solidarity with the dignity of all people as our guiding principle. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Human Rights Day virtual program. 
Up ahead, we will be looking at four themes in particular that are important to address in a bid to recover better together. Discrimination, sustainable development, inequalities, and participation and solidarity. Now, structural discrimination and racism has meant that the pandemic has disproportionately affected minorities. People in discriminated groups were overexposed and underprotected due to limited healthcare access. And the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has highlighted an increase in stigmatization, labeling, and scapegoating. But amid this rising tide of discrimination, individuals and communities are finding ways to provide better support to those most affected. We bring you two such stories. The first from Panama on the impact of lockdown measures on transgender people. Primero de abril, el gobierno panameño puso una medida de salida de cuarentena binaria en donde eh, decidieron que basado en el sexo de, en la cédula y el último número de la cédula era la hora que una persona pudiera salir a poder hacer sus compras eh, de comida. Personas trans, eh, tanto hombres trans como mujeres trans como personas no binarias, fueron discriminadas, eh, detenidas, eh, multadas, incluso se les denegó el acceso a servicios básicos. Fue momentos muy difíciles para nosotras, incluyéndome para mí, porque eh, me sentía la verdad mal, a veces no sabía ni qué hacer, si tenía que salir o no, si salgo eh, en el Día de los Hombres, aún me cuestionaban, me discriminaban, y eh, peor si salía el Día de las Mujeres, ya a mí me dolió tanto, hasta a mí no me dejaron entrar al súper para poder comprar alimentos secos, no me permitieron, me tuvieron que, me humillaron, iba con mi hermanita y me dijeron, tú no eres mujer, eres hombre, tienes que ir. Y en ese momento de preocupación estábamos hablando los miembros de Fundación Iguales y Hombres Trans y llegamos a la conclusión de que tenía que haber personas cisgénero o personas no trans que estuvieran dispuestas a ayudar. Y así fue como nace la idea de la red solidaria, como un formulario para conectar a la persona que quería ayudar con la persona trans que no podía salir de su casa. Cuando inicia todo esto de la pandemia, que empieza todo esto del confinamiento, me pregunto como psicóloga qué puedo hacer para apoyar. Contacto a Pau González y empezamos a pensar cuáles son aquellos espacios que podemos generar para el bienestar. Definitivamente esta crisis de confinamiento nos afecta a todos como seres humanos y es a través de la red solidaria cuando unimos fuerzas y nos damos cuenta de lo importante de salir juntos adelante de esta situación. Con la medida binaria de cuarentena, pues Panamá fue el único país en el mundo que mantuvo esta medida que por, que por cierto no, no hay ninguna evidencia científica que la medida haya hecho que los casos se hubieran disminuido. Actualmente no existe ni una sola ley que contemple a las personas LGBT. Entonces partimos ya desde una desigualdad eh, existente en donde con la pandemia se resaltó muchísimo más. Eh, la red constituye una plataforma de solidaridad única eh, para reconstruir mejor los derechos y las vidas de las personas. Y no solamente hablamos de derechos fundamentales, como puede ser la salud, sino sobre todo constituye un ejemplo de solidaridad hacia las personas que tradicionalmente han estado excluidas y también discriminadas. Fue como una bendición muy grande para las compañeras y en general para la población trans. Porque desde que la Fundación Iguales y Hombres Trans crearon esa red solidaria para personas trans, nos tomaron en cuenta porque saben que hay una población trans indígena. Hay una luz, hay personas que quieren ayudar y conocer de nuestra lucha y de nuestras opresiones para darnos la mano y acompañarnos en este camino. We will now hear the story of Shaima from Tunisia, a sign language interpreter who did something beautiful and simple. She saw an important need, and she volunteered to use her skills to fill it. And in so doing, she made a huge difference in the lives of people who are deaf and hearing impaired in Tunisia. We work in the 
تخدم في خدمة الطبيب تخدم في خدمة الشخشاخ تخدم في خدمة الصحافي خاطر لازمك تجيب معلومة صحيحة في وقتها وتكون المعلومة بغير في كونسيز معناها ما لازمكش تعطي معلومة غلطة أحمد بدر تشايمة أنه الأشخاص من العاقة السمعية أصبح عنده الحق للوصول للمعلومة وهذه من الأشياء اللي تخليها من مارس المواطنتهم وأيضا تمتعوا بحق قص عليه الاتفاقية التولية العاقة للعاقة وأيضا نظامة الدستور التونسي كل سورتو كيف وقت اللي بدينا نلبسوا في الماسك معناها انه مع الماسك مع ما كانش فما ما نجمش نقراو على الشفايف معناها الكوميونيكاسيون ولات صعيبه ما نجموش نمسوا ما نجموش نقربوا مع عند العباد قبل على الاقل كان عندنا الميميك كان عندنا الوجه كنا نجموا نقراو افيك لو بور دو ماسك توا صعيبه معناها المساله في الخدمه زاد قبل كيف كيف كنا كيما قلنا كنا قبل معناتها مع البور دو ماسك اوبليغاتوار عند الناس الكل بريود الكونفينمون في الدار الاميه بالكل لي زونتوندون كانوا يحكيوا في التليفون كان ينجم يسال بسيكولوج كان ينجم اما بالنسبه للاصم اوني تي ليفغي ان نو ميم سورتو في صحتنا النفسيه معناها كان يكون فما مشاكل مع العائله مع كل شيء ما كانش فما حتى حد اللي ينجم يتلهالنا بصحتنا النفسيه الموتيفاسيون جاتني من اني انا نعرف الكوميونيتي بالباهي نعرف لي بوزوان تاعهم وهي عمليه نجم نقولوا انسانيه اكثر من الواجب نتاعك خاطر انت تعرف اللي كان انت عندك المعلومه واللي كان انت ما تقدمش وتقعد تستنى حتى الناس تعطيك حقك والا خاطر هي الخدمه نتاعنا كل شيء تنجم برشا عباد صحتها تكون في خطر وينجم برشا عباد لا قدر الله يتعرضوا لسوء فقط خاطر انت سبقت الفلوس على الواجب نتاعك الوطني ولا الواجب نتاعك الانساني Welcome back. Staying with the topic of discrimination, let's go now to Brazil. I spoke earlier to Leonardo Sakamoto, a journalist and an activist who has campaigned on the anti-slavery and slave labor cause for decades. In 2001, he created Reporter Brazil to expose the inhuman and slave-like conditions of workers in his country. He was also on the board of directors of the UN Volunteer Trust Fund on Contemporary Forms of Slavery. Leonardo's work and pursuit for justice and recognition of the rights of those facing discrimination and slavery has been relentless. When I spoke to him, I started off by asking him how the impact of the pandemic was felt in the communities that he works with. Billions of workers have been affected worldwide, uh, but the pandemic has been especially violent with the most vulnerable sections mm -hmm. of the population. COVID has hit hard on those in the formal, informal economy who therefore do not have the protections provided for labor legislation, for example. Domestic workers, migrants are particularly hard hit. And of course, discrimination by gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, social origin, which already made it difficult for people to access this and work, had its effects increased when met with the pandemic. Mm. Uh, coronavirus did not create our prejudices, in fact, but enhanced them. I remember one story. João Pedro was a 14 years old boy, black boy. Uh, mm -hmm living in Rio de Janeiro. On May 18th of this year, he was playing with his cousins. When the house was invaded by police in mm. this Janeiro, he was killed by a rifle shot that pierced his body from stomach to the shoulder. Community leaders uh, counted 72 bullet holes in the house of João Pedro. And uh, of course, that João Pedro is one of the many Brazilian George Floyds and uh, yes. Like people that are shot by the police, by the the the, the, the state violence. Yeah. But it's also important to remember that many people experience pandemic light, uh, like slaughter on daily basis, even without the virus. 
uh, in genocides that are going on around the planet. Probably uh, the pandemic helped us to feel empathy with yeah. uh, the other and to be possible to, after that, look uh, for better uh, a better word for uh, everyone. Yes. Yes. The problem is uh, that uh, COVID did not invent racism, did not invent discrimination, did not invent slave labor, did not invent extreme poverty, but show it, show it that uh, these problems are too big to be hidden. How in the aftermath of this pandemic, aftermath is a very hopeful thought um, of this pandemic, um, do you see us recovering better together when it comes to fighting slavery and discrimination? Governments now have to deepen policies in order to improve conditions for minorities and take mm -hmm. advantage of learning in this moment. This includes not only professional education and access to the labor market, but also ensures health, safety in order to address the shameful difference in the opportunities related to the skin of color, for example. Mm -hmm. The problem is that many government officials think that injustice is not the discrimination, but the affirmative action. And they defend meritocracy as if it is was possible to talk about it in a society in which people have totally different conditions at the start point of their personal journey, which often helps define that will happen through their entire existence. What is happening now shows the path what, uh, that we, we need to do. This pandemic has had devastating impacts on the economic and social rights of people across the globe, which have exacerbated and fed the pervasive inequalities both within and among countries. The gap between the richest and the poorest continues to grow wider. Now, the World Bank estimates that the pandemic will push another 176 million people into poverty. Now, on the other hand of the spectrum, a study by the World Inequality Lab of the Paris School of Economics noted that the world's wealthiest people increased their wealth by 25% during the pandemic. Such gross and growing inequalities have to be tackled at the national and international level as a matter of urgency. But there's always something that each of us can do in small ways and big to help lift those of us who are the most vulnerable and to advocate for the protection of their rights. This next story from Senegal shows just how we can work together to recover better and stand up for human rights. Nous sommes à Grand Medine, un quartier populaire de Dakar et c'est un lieu de prédilection des des enfants talibés naturellement parce qu'il y a beaucoup de monde qui y passe. Ce sont des enfants âgés de 2 à 15 ans à peu près et qui sont confiés par leurs parents à des maîtres coraniques pour leur apprendre la religion musulmane et le Coran. Et ces maîtres coraniques les amènent dans les centres-villes pour les forcer à manger. Au début de la pandémie, elles n'étaient pas dans les plans de prise en charge. Malgré les mesures prises, l'état d'urgence décrété, le couvre-feu et tout, on voyait encore énormément d'enfants dans les rues. Pendant cette période-là, on ne les donnait plus à l'aumône parce que les gens avaient peur de la transmission. Donc ce qui fait que ces enfants étaient confrontés à une double vulnérabilité. Ils étaient laissés à eux-mêmes dans les rues, mais ils n'avaient même pas de quoi manger. Et donc c'est en ce moment-là que nous avons tiré l'alerte pour que le gouvernement puisse prendre en charge ces enfants dans les plans de réponse. Merci. Maintenant, ces enfants bénéficient aussi, comme dans tous les centres, des activités socio-éducatives, notamment l'alphabétisation, les activités d'insertion comme le cuir, les activités sportives comme le, voilà, comme le cirque. Cela a permis une meilleure prise en charge des enfants là qui transitaient dans ces centres pour rentrer dans leur famille. Ces 
Ce que cette pandémie nous a enseigné est qu'on ne peut pas vivre en vase clos. On a négligé les droits des enfants à un moment donné. Ça pouvait être également un déclic pour permettre à l'État de prendre en charge durablement cette question-là. Cela nous rappelle encore une fois que l'inclusion est très importante pour l'accès aux droits et pour un développement durable. Welcome back to Recovering Better, Stand Up for Human Rights, where we look at how to build back better with stories that inspire and innovate. I'm your host, Ravina Shandasani. Now, music is an expression of the diversity of human beings. Music can bring us all together from every culture and tradition and speak to all of us and remind us in these difficult circumstances of our common humanity. It is in this spirit that award-winning musician and composer Max Richter created Voices, a musical project based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Along with BAFTA award-winning filmmaker Yulia Mar, the team have created music and film to convey the uplifting vision of a better, fairer world set out by the Universal Declaration. Here, Max and Yulia introduce the video All Human Beings that's based on the first article of the Declaration, which states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. Enjoy. I guess the project, in a sense, starts from a, a feeling of dissatisfaction about the world we have made. A sense of, you know, things which somehow we got lost along the way. Um, the world that we see around us is a world which really doesn't reflect the values uh, set out in the Declaration. So, so, yeah, the project is about, you know, trying to, in a way, remind us um, of of the you know human potential, human possibilities, human creativity, imagination, all of those good things. And I think we were both together looking for something to give us all hope. This, you know, and, and there's been so many huge changes, not just in the last year, but in the last ten years particularly. And we were looking for hope, and we were looking for um, to give our children hope, and to give the next generation hope as well. And I think the text does that. It's a very hopeful document, mm. and that's fundamental to it, I think. It's a wonderful um, occasion to, first of all, you know, celebrate um, human rights, to remind ourselves of them, to talk of, to talk of them, and to, yeah, spread the message widely. Um, Voices is all about the text of the Declaration. You know, that's the sort of alpha and omega of that whole piece. It's, it's, it's only there because of that text. Well, I, I hope that people watch it and that, that they come away with a greater sense of compassion. The video is all about compassion and it's to do with a shared community shared experience of life and that we all do share no matter who we are no matter which country we live in i'm going to read you the universal declaration of human rights the preamble Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. Now therefore the General Assembly proclaims this Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society, keeping this declaration constantly in mind, 
shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance. Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity. All human right. beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of community. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the country to which a person belongs. Welcome back to the program. I'm your host, Ravina Shamdasani. In the days leading up to Human Rights Day, we've been challenging you out there to show your support for recovering better and standing up for human rights. Our social media challenge was launched on 1 December by the High Commissioner, Michelle Bachelet, where she challenged others to show their support for human rights. The challenge is an easy way to show your support. Why don't you have a go right now? All you need to do is take a photo of yourself holding up a sign that says, Recover Better, Stand Up for Human Rights. Post it on your social media account with the hashtags Stand Up for Human Rights and Recover Better. And that's it. You could even be featured on our wall of champions where we like to acknowledge those who help stand up. There is still time to post, so please join the challenge, make a sign, nominate your friends to do it too. For us all to recover better, we need to promote sustainable development for all, leaving no one behind. The Sustainable Development Goals are 17 goals crafted by all UN member states to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Well, the pandemic has had an impact there too. Access to education, gender equality, good health and well-being, reports have shown that all 17 of the SDGs have been negatively impacted by the crisis. Environmental degradation is on the rise. We have already seen how healthcare systems have been stretched in many countries. And school closures have left thousands of children without access to education. But in the face of such grand goals and seemingly insurmountable obstacles placed by this monster pandemic, these teachers from Jamaica took it upon themselves to make sure that no child is left behind in their communities using the powerful tools of a blackboard and some chalk. One day I was just around the back of my yard doing some chores and I heard a lot of noise. And I went to my gate to look to see what it was and I saw children running up and down wild. A lot of kids, some riding bicycles, others playing different games. And I was like, wow, and this was school time. I know that if it wasn't the COVID, they would have been in class. So as a teacher, I took responsibility. I felt responsible because 
I was like, because we're not able to be with them, they're out there doing that. And I felt sad. And I knew that I had to do something about it. Then the thought came to me, paint blackboards in this community, put up the work at a designated spot and let parents know. So everybody can just come and access it. Take their phone, take picture, and take it back in, inside their, their home for their children. And that's what I did. Early every morning, Mrs. McCoy Phipps and her assistants go to different communities where they religiously write the day's lesson on the community blackboard. The devout teacher says the COVID-19 pandemic has only increased her resolve to reach as many students as possible. It's called for teachers to be critical thinkers and proactive. And I can't let my children um, down. It doesn't matter if they're not members of my class. I just know definitely that I am responsible for the nation's children, so I'll have to do something about it. Behind every zinc fence and board lies a lot of children with great potential and ability. A project like this is important because it represents a community response to a community-based problem that has nationwide implications. And she's impacting hundreds of children with this simple idea. Education is a human right. We all have a right to a quality education. These blackboards are ways to help ensure at least some access to the content for the children so that at least every day they have something structured happening. She's working with the parents and the community to make sure that the teaching and learning doesn't stop and we applaud her for that. Equal access to education. You don't know where these great children are. You just have to make sure that nobody's left behind, hold their hands and bring them. Every child can learn, every child must learn. What a creative, beautiful way to keep the lessons going for children with little or no access to the internet. But also an important reminder that the digital divide needs to be bridged. All children should have access to education. We'd like to thank our colleagues at UNICEF for bringing us this story. For our next story, we go to Thailand, where a vast team of government-sponsored health volunteers were mobilized during the pandemic. These volunteers are well respected in the villages where they work, and they're mainly female. volunteers are helping to break the stereotype that the role of women in society is limited at home, families and domestic slaves. But it is quite obvious that the health volunteer sector is dominated by women. I think women can take meaningful roles in pandemic prevention for the whole community and for the country. เราก็ยอมเสียสละในการว่าออกไปตรวจสุขภาพที่บ้านเอาผลผลของคนไข้เนี่ยเอามาให้หมอเพื่อหมอเนี่ยจะได้ใจกันแล้วเราก็เอา
อย่างน้อยเนี่ยในชุมชนเนี่ยเราก็ได้แบ่งเบาภาระหน้าที่ของเขาได้บางอย่างในหน้าที่ที่เราสามารถทําได้My next guest is as recognizable for his work on issues of peace, development, and youth activism as he is for his work on screen. Forrest Whitaker is an artist known for such iconic roles as Idi Amin in The Last King of Scotland. He's also UNESCO's special envoy for peace and reconciliation. As the founder of the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, he creates programs to foster peace and reconciliation in fragile communities. He's also a UN Sustainable Development Goals champion. One of the main issues stemming from the pandemic is the complexity of its impacts in so many aspects of human life. The direct footprint of the virus is significant. Tens of millions of people have been infected, and nearly one and a half million people have already died of the virus. But many others beyond those figures also suffer from COVID-19 because it stressed the capacity of our hospitals and medical staff. In this sense, we are the victims of not just the virus, but also of the failures in our healthcare systems. This is a stark reminder that the SDGs, and especially SDG 4's focus on health, are called to think in the long run. And to look at problems from different angles, we are facing the same shortcomings when it comes to other impacts of the virus, such as the economic crisis and the subsequent rise in poverty and inequality. The impact on education will also be felt for years if we fail to level the inequalities of access to education that the virus has revealed and amplified. In this regard, I also think that we must pay particular attention to the fates of youth, while the victims of the disease have suffered the most. The young women and men of the world are probably the group with the next greatest impact, as they have lost major elements of their education, their job opportunities, and have faced major challenges in their personal and emotional development as well. They are largely invisible victim of COVID-19. We collectively need to make an extra effort to reach out to young people and to listen to what they have to say about the whole situation. The bottom line of the SDGs is that no one should be left behind, and this includes you. Working with young people is central to my mission, both as UNESCO Special Envoy for Peace and Reconciliation, and as CEO of the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative. Youth are our partners on the ground. When COVID-19 first impacted the countries where my foundation has a presence, the youth we work with quickly came to us, asking for support to help their communities and face the pandemic. In South Sudan and Uganda, 1,300 youth peacemakers went into villages and remote areas. To disseminate reliable information about the COVID-19 virus, and shared hygienic supplies like soap and hand washing stations with more than 250,000 people. They produce close to 55,000 face masks to support the remote villages. In South Africa, our youth have been requested by local leaders to organize awareness events in response to the rise of domestic violence that followed the lockdowns. All in all, these youth have reminded us that whatever challenges we are faced with. There can be no sustainable future for humanity. We don't work together in the spirit of solidarity. To build back better means that you need to develop and showcase resilience. This is what I have learned from my work in conflict-affected and vulnerable areas. When an earthquake strikes down a house that stood on fragile, worn-out foundations. You don't want the same house rebuilt. You want a house that can better withstand the tremors. You want it to be resilient. In my view, the transformative element of the 2030 agenda points to this notion of resilience. When you aim for resilience, you cannot be satisfied with doing the same thing time and again. First, you want to pay attention to the local context rather than applying one-size-fits-all models that will not prove resilient in the long run. This means that. You must listen to the voices of local people, make them a part of the solution. It boils down to respecting and promoting human rights. 
If we intend to build back better after COVID-19, we must be in tune with people's rights, needs, and aspirations. We need international efforts and national commitments, but we need this inclusion to have local resilience. In order for solutions to challenges like poverty, hunger, universal education, gender equality, youth empowerment, and lasting peace to be solved sustainably, the beneficiaries must want to adhere to them. Inclusion and resilience are how our shared humanity will be able to build back better. Today, we celebrate the human rights of all human beings. Happy Human Rights Day. You're watching Recover Better, Stand Up for Human Rights, a Human Rights Day event. I'm your host, Ravina Shamdasani, Deputy Spokesperson for the UN Human Rights Office. Don't forget, High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet answers some of your questions a bit later in the program. Now, this pandemic has made it crystal clear. We are all in this together. From individuals to governments, from civil society to grassroots communities, everybody has a role in building a post-COVID world that is better for us all. Recovering better means encouraging participation and solidarity. We need to ensure that the voices of those most affected inform recovery efforts. People should be empowered and given platforms to speak up without fear of being silenced and to participate in the decisions that affect their own lives. Our next story from Ukraine is about using digital technology to ensure that people living on the margins of society are able to have a voice and a livelihood. В селі дуже важко, роботи немає і не так легко, ну, строїться навіть на роботу. Вони бачать, що Роман, ну, все, бояться люди. Інколи буває таке, що навіть соціальну допомогу нам не хочуть оформлювати. Вони на тебе викрикують, понаражали цих дітей, ви їх угодуйте. Соціальна ізоляція та дискримінація піддають великому ризику ромську національну громаду, тим паче у зв'язку з пандемією, яка розвивається швидкими темпами в Україні. На жаль, через те, що деякі роми не мають документів, які посвідчують їх особу, вони не можуть заключати угоди з сімейними лікарями. І це дає свій результат, вони не можуть отримати медичну допомогу і взагалі доступ до медичних послуг ускладнюється. У нас в планах є реалізація такої ініціативи, як робота з підприємцями серед ромів. Це будуть, власне, ну, я вважаю, що це мають бути малі підприємці, які зазнали збитків під час цього періоду. І наше завдання буде дати їм навички адаптації, переходу до сучасних реалій в таких умовах. Це, можливо, і реалізація їх діяльності онлайн, можливо, якось переформатувати ті послуги, які вони надають, більш зробити їх, знову ж таки, безпечними. Ми б хотіли, щоб суспільство в Україні сприймало різноманіття як цінність, а не як проблему. During the pandemic, we have all witnessed and perhaps carried out acts of solidarity, small and big. Globally, we've heard many political leaders pledge solidarity.
but one human rights defender takes exception to the abuse of the word solidarity. Abdulaziz Mohammed spent nearly six years at an offshore detention facility at Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. He drew attention to the plight of the migrants and refugees at the facility through podcasts and books. He is a Martin Ennels Award winner, and he's now based in Geneva, Switzerland. I had the privilege of speaking to him earlier when I asked him what solidarity means to him. We need to be sure that this solidarity will include every human being on this earth. Mm. So this mm. is the real solidarity. And also we need to practice the measure that will help us to implement the solidarity, which means that I need to knock the door of my neighbors. I need to make sure that the sick people who are the vulnerable people really facing this risk that need the help. But what yeah. we are seeing today, it's a completely an opposite solidarity that mixed up with the nationalism, mm. which means that solidarity has created a nationalism. And nationalism has created what? Has forced the world leaders to close their borders mm. and to keep their own people, which means that each and every one of the world leaders today is calling for, I mean, a solidarity among his own people among the territory of the, its own people. Um, you've talked about how the pandemic has really brought to the surface and deepened a lot of the vulnerabilities and issues that already existed. So how can we use this to really recover better together? Our role is to stand up and, and make sure that, I mean, whether you are refugees and migrants or citizens of the world, you share one thing in a common, which is humanity and which is an open arms and sharing the responsibility among ourselves and also make sure that each and every one of us will have any space to isolate himself and also to practice the measure that's been put out by the world government, such as the, the, the organization, such as like the distance. Yeah, yeah. And your entitlement to the full gamut of human rights. It sounds like such a simple message um, to, you know, just recognize that we are all human beings. Um, but your experience, Aziz, has shown that this is not the case. I mean, for a very long time on Manus Island, you were known as QNK002, um, a number which symbolically means so much um, about, you know, recognition of, of the basic condition of being human. Um, how do you see us uh, bringing back this humanity? Um, how do you see you know, again, being able to recover better together. We all do have the powers. And right. if we don't practice our roles and if we don't use our power, when, when I say power, let people not, I mean, mistakenly understand this that as going, destroying things. No, mm -hmm. your voice is your power. Your voice is your power. And to, to empower you more is the human rights. Mm -hmm. You can use the human rights mechanism plus your, your voice, I mean, people could hear you no matter where you are. I was on Manus. I was on Manus in a place where in the middle of, I mean, in the end of the world. I mean, I mean, close down in the middle of the ocean. No one's even know where, where I am. But people are still able to listen to my voice. People are able to listen to my stories, going through the podcast, I mean, reading the, the books yeah. that we wrote and all of this. This is the power. And That's I believe easy. that all of us, we have it. We all have the power, indeed, powerful words from Abdulaziz. Each of us, we have the power to make a difference. In our next and final story, we go to Cambodia, where they asked a variety of people what recovering better looked like to them. And the answer was a music video. ไอ้ครับชอชงใดเฮาយើងเชียนเชิง
Welcome back. Let's take a bit of a closer look at the importance of participation, particularly that of young people. Arisa Nokum is a peace and education advocate from the Philippines. She's a member of the Extremely Together Initiative, which is part of the Kofi Annan Foundation. Her multi-faith background as the daughter of a Catholic father and a Muslim mother inspired her to use education as a tool to promote peace and tolerance. She's the founder of the Chris Library, which is an NGO that has built libraries and provided scholarships to school children living in areas affected by conflict. She has also started a program to train young peace builders in the Philippines. Now, when I spoke to her earlier, she told me she believes young people have an important role to play in recovering better, particularly when it comes to participation. I think participation is extremely important mm -hmm. because right now, when we look at the leadership of most countries, it's mostly yeah. male. They, they mostly come from um, middle or upper income families. They mostly are educated and they're mostly from the majority of the population, whatever that majority is. Mm -hmm. um, so usually when it comes to participation, minorities aren't often listened to. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a lot of young people in the fore. I think in 2020 and in the coming years, what we need to do is increase that participation mm -hmm. and not only to listen to a wider range of people, 
but actually to empower them by mm. giving them tools, more resources, and more support. Can you think of perhaps a, an example of how a young person has, you know, taken these lessons and made a difference in their community and helped the community to recover better together? Uh, a few days ago, uh, the Philippines was struck by the strongest typhoon that we had this year. Yeah. Um, and the typhoon came and some people died and a lot of people lost their homes, lost their livelihoods and yeah. the damage is probably in the billions. Mm. So entire populations, their homes wiped out and their possessions lost. Mm. And one unique um, effort that I saw was that there was a group of students mm -hmm. who were pooling resources to store up mobile credits. And oh. it's a very overlooked resource because apparently here in the Philippines, um, a lot yeah. of students who attend online classes these days, they don't have enough money to have like a postpaid account. They use prepaid credits. So they created um, a campaign to pull together people's extra credits from their mobiles. It was amazing because I am not a student anymore, so I'm not taking online classes. So I wouldn't have known that this was a necessity, but these 13 year olds, 14, 15 year olds recognized that this was a need of those people their age. So they mobilized to give that to them. Any messages that you want to give out there to young people or to people of um, more advanced age um, <laughs> on uh, you know, taking young people seriously and uh, why their participation is important in building back a better world for us? Whenever I talk to um, people in position, people who create policies, I always tell them that when we have these problems that we've never seen before because of climate change, because of the pandemic, because of all these new challenges to democracy or to stable societies that we've seen in the recent years, when we have problems that are out of this world, we can't just use the solutions that we've been using these past years. So we need to tap into our reserves of creativity and innovation. And for me, that's really these young people whose imaginations are, you know, always on the run and unbridled. Yeah. Yeah. And who can really tap into their inner reserves of playfulness and creativity. And when you're able to um, leverage that, then I believe we'll come up with very creative solutions to all these problems we're facing. So true what Arisa said. Facing new challenges and problems, we can't just turn to the same tired old so-called solutions that have been used all these years. We need to tap into the creativity and playfulness of our young people. We need the participation of young people in helping us recover better. Now it is my great honor to turn to a woman I deeply admire, Michelle Bachelet, our High Commissioner for Human Rights. Michelle Bachelet has served in many capacities through numerous crises, as a doctor, as a Minister of Defense, as a Minister of Health, as President of Chile two times, and as Head of UN Women, and also as a mother, grandmother, and so much more. High Commissioner, welcome. Hi, Commissioner, this year has, of course, been dominated by a public health emergency, um, the pandemic. Your message throughout this time has been consistent, um, that this is a human rights crisis, um, and the issues that it has thrown up are not new, but in fact, it has just deepened and accelerated the crisis. And you've asked for human rights to be at the center of the response. Why do human rights have to be at the center of a response to a public health emergency? Even though... Um the pandemic of COVID-19, it is a uh, public health crisis. Um, on one hand, it has laid, laid bare all the inequalities that exist in our world between countries and inside countries. Uh, the inequalities in terms of access to, to care, access to, to, to health, mm -hmm. access to education mm -hmm. as well, uh, access to, to, to the right to, to, to live adequately. Um, the, the right, uh, um, difficulties on the right to a good housing or clean water mm -hmm. or, or, or sanitary conditions. So it has laid bare the, the number of human rights that are not being respected in the world. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about human rights has to be in the center, 
It is that we need to ensure those rights for the people. Mm. We need to ensure the participation of the people in terms of how they can really um, make their voices heard and the, in the moment that decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. So we need to ensure that people's human rights are in the center of, the res of their response to the crisis mm -hmm. and in particular onto the recovery as well. How has discrimination uh, kind of deepened during the crisis and why is it necessary to tackle it in response to this crisis? Well, I think that discrimination exists always, huh? before mm. the crisis. And, and uh, wh while I was Minister of Health many times, I heard people telling me how far away the health facilities were, when they were, when there, how they were sometimes because they were indigenous, how they were treated. Mm. So this, and I guess so in, in many European countries, the same, same thing could say people from minorities, right. that they feel that they don't always have access to health care. Also, people from the LGBTI community, for yes. example, have little access to the healthcare system. They were, uh, because of the stereotype, the prejudices, and so on. There are older people, people living with disabilities, women and girls, uh, LGBTI, refugees, migrants, IDPs, mm -hmm. well, people in prisons because of their conditions. Yeah. Um, so, indigenous people, of course. So, all these people, because if you look at the, the, the rates of infection, they might be, you know, widespread. Mm. But when you see at the rate of the death yes. toll, you see that it's focused on minorities. And mm. why is that? Mm. First, because they have less access to health care. Mm. Second, because uh, they live in, they in, poor, in poorer conditions, as we were talking, mm. smaller houses, not always with sanitary and water conditions. Third, because they usually work in the more precarious job. Yeah. Many, of, many of them is the so-called essential services, like the cleaning, like the bus drivers, where they do have, are more exposed. Well, also even to, healthcare workers and teachers. Of course, healthcare workers and teachers. Yeah. And, and, and many of them are also migrants and, yeah. and so on. So I would, see, I would say we do have an issue mm. of, the, of discrimination, uh, racial discrimination, but also ethnic and religious discrimination that is affecting many places. And that means that they are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19. And this dip disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on minorities, um, this uh, it's across the globe, isn't it? It's not just in the lower income or middle income countries. We're talking about rich countries. We're talking across the spectrum. Yeah, and you more. see the gap. For example, in the U.S., uh, the majority of people who have died in terms of the relation with the rate in the population are Afro-Americans Afro right. and Latinos. Mm. In the UK are Afro-Americans, Afro Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, mm. and in both and in every place, poorest people and the poorest people. And when we talk about inequalities, I mean, that, it, the sustainable development goals, um, which were set by UN member states with, you know, very ambitious goals um, to be achieved by 2030, we've seen a real setback. Um, in the accomplishment of these SDGs, haven't we? Um, how do we get back on track? Well, first of all, I would say if we, uh, we when we came to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were already late. Mm. Because if we would have been able to be, I would say, more advanced in the Agenda 2030, maybe we would be better prepared because mm. we have been fighting with some many of these issues that we're talking. I mean, people would have had uh, the right to food, I'm sure, the right yeah. to... to, to to water and, and to a, a clean environment, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's crucial that we go back to the Agenda 2030. What are some of these tools that the government can use? Because they also always talk about limited resources um, and there's a you know, chronic underinvestment in education and healthcare, for example. I mean, there's always limited resources. The resources mm -hmm. are always limited, but the, the interesting thing of the economy is that you should use it to improve the welfare and the conditions of the people to live better. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the first thing I would have to say is even with limited resources, the main thing is political will. Mm. I mean, if you are clear that you need to do A, B, or C, and you put your money there when it's needed, you will have better, 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 better and more effective uh, response. Mm. Second, you have to fight corruption. Right. Corruption, because in many places there are money, but they go to the pockets of some people. The third thing is you need to do progressive tax reforms, mm. because there's a lot of, I mean, in every country, yes, the country can be poor, but you always find rich people, mm. and you always find businesses. The international or national businesses, yeah. and they have to pay their taxes. So you have to ensure that the richer pay more taxes than the poorest, and second, fight uh, fight um, uh, tax aviation. There's a real misunderstanding of these social security nets in society as well, isn't there? Yes, indeed, because this is about 
I mean, this is about the possibility of having everyone living in certain minimal, if I may say, um, decent uh, decent standards of life. Social protection schemes helps everyone because social protection scheme is not charity. Mm -hmm. It's about giving the person all the conditions so the person can stand up and continue working by themselves, doing whatever they need to do Indeed. with better tools, with yeah. better education, with better conditions to be to contribute to the society, yeah. to be a more active part of the society. We're talking a lot about recovering better uh, from this pandemic um, and really solutions um, that, that, that we can offer to states and that we can offer to individuals. Now, you in your lifetime have seen a lot of crises with all your accumulated youth. Um, <laughs> you've seen a lot of crises in your personal life um, as a Minister of Defense, as Minister of Health, as Head of State, as a mother. Um, you've, uh, as a doctor, you've seen people in crisis situations, you've seen your country in crisis situations. Can you give us an example to give us a bit of hope um, on how in one of the, your, your, your past um, uh, encounters with the crisis, you've managed to work to recover better from a crisis? Well, I mean, every crisis produces a lot of pain and grievances. And, yeah. and people get hang angry because usually they feel that everything is too little and too late. But I have, I will mention one example, mm -hmm. but, but there's many examples because we had volcanoes, uh, floodings, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and one was a massive fire that we had mm -hmm. in six or seven regions of the country. And unfortunately, this fire came from different places and uh, surrounded a village. So we had like 24 hours or less to evacuate all the village, mm. all the villagers. So it was completely destroyed, completely destroyed. And it was terrible because it was a, it was a, a, a beautiful place with very people, simple people living there. So what we did, first of all, evacuate them, of course, mm -hmm. put them, in, depending on the situation, into shelters or into some people had families in, in other cities close by. Mm -hmm. And so on. we supported them with... with uh, food, clothes, because they lost everything. And then <clears throat> after the fire was controlled, we started cleaning the place, mm. having meetings with the, with the organization, with mm. the neighbors, and, and working with them how we build back. And in this build back, we try to improve the quality of, uh, of uh, houses, mm. but also mm. the health facility, the firefighter station, the police station, and so on. And, and it took some time, and that's one thing that many times is difficult for people to accept, that it's not easy to build back in a minute. Yes. It takes some time. Yes. But if you do it with the people that participate... Participation of those who are most affected. So this question comes from Suda Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Um, who sent it to us via Twitter. Now, Suzanne's question to challenge you, High Commissioner. She's beginning to wonder if anyone actually cares about human rights anymore. Are they just a fantasy? We have been searching for hours for a long time now. If it is easier to dismiss complaints with excuses, why bother having them at all? Well, I think <clears throat> in my daily life, I live with the worst sometimes mm. situations. And of course, there are people who could not care, I mean, less about human rights, of yeah. course. Yeah. And there's also people who violate, in, 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 I mean, human rights and, and they feel it's a right because they are fighting terrorism or they are fighting uh, whatever they feel is a is a yeah. is something that puts them in risk uh, but also i've met so many human rights defenders mm. women's rights defenders land rights defenders environmental defenders that uh, they even put their lives in risk because but because they want to ensure not only their human rights but the other people's rights so i think that in that case, what I would tell Susan is to follow the, uh, the, the motto of Archbishop Arsh uh, Desmond Tutu. Mm. He says, I am a prisoner of hope. <laughs> I think we need hope. <laughs> Another one from Twitter. Uh, this one's from uh, Michael Joe. Hi, Michael. Got a job. Can I ask that? Sounds like he wants to work with us after everything that we've been saying about how amazing our jobs are. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are jobs, and you can look at it in the if you fit the profiles in the UN career uh, page. But also, you could join an NGO in your neighborhood and your country that also works for human rights. Um, now, this is another question, much more general. What exactly is Human Rights Day, and why are we sitting here celebrating it? 
Well, in 1948, the 10th of December in Paris, uh, there was the signature of the human, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think the world after two worlds, particularly Second World War, decided that this could not happen again. Mm -hmm. I mean, that no yes. one deserved to leave something like this again. And decided to think on which would be the essential rights that all of us should have because mm -hmm. of being human rights, human beings only because of being human beings. Mm. And we need to ensure uh, that all the people in the world can have access to all these rights. So mm. I think it's still very valid. And that's why we celebrate it. Not to say everyone has its human rights ensured. No, it's to say these are the minimal standards for all human beings. And we need to, when we celebrate what we are saying, we affirm our commitment right. to continue working at different levels, as member states, as parliament, as people in the community, as business, as, um, as everyone, all the peoples of the world, to ensure that we can say, yes, now Universal Declaration is a reality. And this brings us to the end of our show. We would like to thank the experts, Dr. Tedros from WHO, Leonardo Sakamoto, Arisa Nokum, Abdulaziz Mohammed and Forrest Whitaker for taking the time to give their views on how we can recover better. We would also like to pay a tribute to those whose stories we saw today. Your work has been an inspiration. If each of us can draw one lesson from your creativity, resourcefulness, passion and desire to stand up for the rights of your fellow human beings, I think we will be well on the road to recovering better together.